We've been in this study called The Gospel in Life, and the text I'm going to look at today is one that you could have a hundred talks on and not really scratch the surface. So really tough, um, a lot for us to get, Um, but we're continuing to move forward in the book. So I hope you'll follow along with me. Um, It goes in a direction of a really important truth that we need to grasp about our life together with God. This is the word of God. So I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we look at your word, that you will, as you promise, you'll give us your Spirit to teach us these things. Lord, we feel like we know so little about the ways that your Spirit works in the world and in us. And so I pray, Father, as we come, that you will You'll teach us, you'll lead us. We open our hearts and lives as we were just singing to the presence of your spirit, that you would reveal yourself to us and that you would give us life in Christ. And we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. You're going to do it. I mean, that's what we really hear in a way. When we come into life in the body of Christ, you're going to have this completely new life. So in 2004, this movie that I would recommend called Spanglish came out. Maybe you've seen it. It tells this story. Actually, Adam Sandler, uh, Tia Leone play John and Deborah Klasky. They're an affluent couple. They're living in Malibu, California, and their marriage is crumbling. It's falling apart. And at the same time that Deborah is having an affair, she's also trying to fix her daughter who's going through adolescence. And one of the scenes that is really impactful, because I think as parents we don't know what we're doing, but is really impactful when you watch it. So one day, uh, Bernice, their daughter, as she's called Bernie, is there with her dad. They're hanging out. They're working on homework together. And the mom comes in to the room in which they're in with these bags of new clothes that she has purchased. And Bernie just bursts out, hey, what did I do right that you're bringing me these clothes? And her mom gives her a big kiss and says, well, I went nuts. I got all this stuff. And so Bernice goes over and she starts pulling out of the bag these clothes. And she tries on the first, it looks like a jacket, and she realizes it's just a little too small. And she looks at the tag, and indeed, it is one size too small. It's a size eight. And then one by one, you can see her pulling the clothes out of this bag, and she's looking at each one of the tags, and as she's going, she realizes her mother has purchased every one of those garments one size too small. And she's trying to hold back her tears. And her mother says, come on, you're, you're going to do it. You're going to look beautiful. You're going to lose that weight. And just you can see the feeling of shame begin to come across her face. She is devastated, and she retreats to their bathroom, and she says, please excuse me, I I just need to be alone. 
And you see this scene where her, her face has a mixture of shame, a little bit of fear, a lot of sadness. She, she thought she was going to get a gift. She thought her mother was, was showing her love and affection. And here she's judging her. She's heaping expectations on her. And she's really even shaming her. You know, as I saw that, I thought, you know, in a way that's what we do to people. You know, we want this good stuff for us and for you, and then we heap it on to you, making you feel like, oh yeah, you can do this. You're going to do it, right? And the Galatians have been through this. The writer of Paul has written a letter to a church who came by faith, simply God's love for them. They're not a part of Judaism. They don't have a history with God. They've been loved by God. They've come into the community of God's people, and now it's like, you're going to do it. You're going to get your lives together. Yeah, you used to be judgmental of other people. You're going to be able to deal with that. You used to have these other challenges. You're going to get your temper under control. And, uh, and you're not going to be that person you used to be before. And what seemed like affirmation has become that judgment and shame that you're not that person. You're not getting your life together. And that's really what they communicated. God expects you to get your life together. And he will love and accept you then. Now, among the people of God, now that you're here, you're going to do this. You're going to be the good person you always were supposed to be. And the amazing thing is they were so excited to learn that they were loved by God. And now they're devastated to be led to believe it all depends on them. They have all of this, these things they have to do. They are back where they started. And our lives feel no different than when we first trusted in Christ. And as I think about that, I think that's what religion does to us, doesn't it? It says, hey, you can do it. You can get your life under control. Sure, Christ died for you, but you've got a huge project in fixing your own life. And this is where the Galatians were. And many of us find ourselves in this same place. So you say, well, isn't that the way it is? Isn't that how we move forward? Well, listen to one Christian writer, Dallas Willard. He says this, it is not simply about trying harder or getting more focused on the choices we make. It is not a direct approach at all. Remember willpower? It cannot be sustained. Every part of you will scream out, it can't be done. Life with God is different. There is no part of you that cannot be transformed under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this hard for us? You know, we think we can use the direct approach. And we don't even understand. I mean, what does this mean through the power of the Holy Spirit? We believe we can do more and we just need more time. I will figure it out. But what he's telling us is it doesn't work that way. Grace has a completely different way, and it opens a completely different way for us to grow and change. And you say, well, how is that? Well, it does that by bringing us to God. You know, the verses that we have before us are filled with the mention of the Holy Spirit. We've learned that when God adopts us, when God brings us into his family, he gives us his spirit, his own presence, sort of like a child is guided by parents in the very beginning to learn life. The most basic things, how to feed themselves, how to walk, how to clothe themselves, those things that Dave was talking about, right? Hygiene, those things. God gives us his spirit for this purpose. And we read earlier in this book, because you are his children... God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now, soon as I mention that in this culture, we have a hard time with this. As I was praying earlier, we've come to believe that really everything there is is all matter and energy. If you can't taste it, see it, smell it, if you can't eat it, it's not real. And so what does spirit or spiritual mean? What is a spiritual life? And what is, who is the Holy Spirit? It just doesn't make sense to us. But at the same time, in our culture, as we live, there's always something more. There's always something that says, well, there's more than just this physical world as you see it. And Jesus actually explained it. He said, it's sort of like the wind. You can't see it, but you can see its effect. 
And so we see the effect of God and the, the presence of God in, in subtle ways, just like we see the effects of the wind. And the amazing thing that he's trying to teach us here is that God is present in his spirit. And when we are thinking of new strategies for ourselves to improve our lives, he has given us his spirit to enable us to live the life of fullness, the life of peace, and the life of, life of joy. In other words, he didn't redeem us to leave us alone. He has not left us alone to do it. I think about three weeks ago, there was an amazing story that sort of captured my attention and communicated this. Uh, a, a man named Joseph Cerna was sentenced to just 24 hours in jail. And the reality is, he had been driving drunk. And it wasn't his first time. And um, they were actually monitoring him. And he lied about a urine test, and it was discovered. And the judge sentenced him to go to jail. Now, here's what was strange about the story, which, which caught my attention. When he arrived at prison, he was not alone. This man was with him. He is actually the judge who sentenced him to be in prison. And you're like, what? And so uh, this man looked at him and he said, where are we going, judge? And the judge asked him, well, we're, we're going to turn ourselves in. And as Cerna was led in to his cell, he sat down on the cot and then he heard a rattle of the door and he saw the judge standing before him and then the judge just came and sat down on the cot next to him. And then somebody came and they locked the door. And they sat in the cell. And the judge is looking at him. He's looking at the judge. He's saying, are you here for the entire time? Are you just coming in to talk to me? And the judge replied, yep, that's what I'm here for. I'm here for the entire time. And you read the story and you say, well, why would the judge do that? Well, there's a backstory. You see this guy, Joseph Cerna. Here's a picture of him has been through a lot. He's actually served four tours in Afghanistan, and he's received three Purple Hearts. And actually, during the last of his tours, he was out with some other guys in an armored car when a roadside bomb went off, and their armored car went into a, a river, or I don't know, it was a body of water, and it was upside down, and he couldn't get out of it because he was buckled in. He said, I, I felt a hand come down and unfasten my seatbelt and release my body armor. And the amazing thing was, he was saved that day. But you know the guy who rescued him? He didn't live. And Joseph walked away from that and the other things that had happened to him with amazing post-traumatic stress. He started drinking. His life was not a good thing. And the amazing thing was this, that wasn't just a judge, that was also somebody who had served in Afghanistan. He had been there too. And when he looked at Joseph, he, he sent him to jail, but he said, I'm not, I'm not going to send you and let you go over there alone. And so he showed up with him in prison, and he stayed with him during that time so that he wouldn't be alone. And I thought, you know, we have this picture of God, of this judge. Oh, yeah, he knows how to speak into our lives and tell us what, what things aren't working. But when it really comes down to us, we're on our own. We're alone. And what we need to find out is that we have a God who has come to us in Christ to be in our presence. And he is on the journey every step of the way in our growth. And the way that he has chosen to do that is through his Holy Spirit. The beautiful gift of his presence. You see, Jesus didn't redeem you. He didn't come and die for you to leave you where you are. But he has promised by his spirit to walk on this journey with you and to deal with all the stuff that's going down in your life so that you could learn what it means to be this child of God. He's leading you into this new life. And that's what I want to look at with you today, this grace-driven life. What is this life in the Spirit like? How does it happen? What should we expect? And listen to how Paul begins this section. He says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, when we read this, you don't know how counter-legalistic this is. You should know that in Judaism, there was one solution to every problem. And that solution was the law. And what the law meant was this. Anything you're struggling with in your life, you're not working at it hard enough. You could solve this if you tried. 
if you really gave yourself, this is doable, you can do this, solve this, and fix this. But Paul doesn't go there. When he's talking about the brokenness in our lives, he says, no, 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 let's, let's think about what God has done. This is really about the Spirit of God. We need to understand what it means to keep in step with the Spirit of God. He says, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. Now, as as hard as this is, we need to talk about the challenge we live with every day, how difficult this is. And Paul uses these words, sinful nature. What does that mean? What do these words mean? The sinful nature is that power that is at work in you that is stronger than your willpower. It drives your life. It keeps you eating unhealthy when your doctor has told you you need to stop and when you've promised yourself you would. It pushes you to be selfish when you know you should love the other people who are around you. And it's sort of like the undertow at the beach. Okay, it doesn't drag you all out at once, but it's just strong enough to hold you in its grip so that you can't get where you need to go. And this is the conflict you're living in every day. He says, yes, you want the right things, but you cannot bring them about. You want to love other people like you should, but you don't fully. And you live in this conflict, again, every day. And by the way, like the undertow at the beach, it's just constant. It is pulling you all the time. And you cannot swim against it. Here's Paul in another place describing it. He says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. He's using those words again. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. We know the story so well. The, the desires, the, the, we want those things. We set out to, to do those things. Now, I remember when I was a kid, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but if you kids haven't watched this, go back and find the re- reruns on Netflix or YouTube. I used to come home from school and watch The Incredible Hulk. If, you know, if you've seen it, you know about it. It starts with Bill Bixby, right, who plays Dr. Banner. And the beginning of, there's Bill, the beginning of every episode starts with these words. Dr. Banner, physician, scientist, searching for a way to tap into the hidden strength that all humans have. Then an an accidental overdose of gamma radiation alters his body chemistry. And now when David Banner grows angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. Yeah, it's like, here's this mild-mannered, he's a sweet-looking guy, and then this transformation happens, and he becomes this Hulk, and he has serious anger issues. He's tearing trees out of the ground and throwing cars around. The good doctor has almost no control over when these moments will come. In fact, they happen against his will. He wants to control these impulses, but he cannot. And then the show goes this predictable pattern. He has some huge blow up and things are destroyed and so on. And maybe he helps and rescues someone, but he has to leave town every time for fear of being found out. So every episode ends like this. There's a very melancholy soundtrack, and he's out by the side of the road, usually walking or hitchhiking to another place. Do you remember that? If you, if you do, you're smiling like me, right? And I think of that, and he says, this is you every day. There are things that work in you that are not under your control. And by the way, your, your issues may not be in the outbursts of anger, but they're in other urges that you can't control. There are other things that are pushing you and your life around in a way that produces all sorts of shame. And Paul says, let me tell you the end result. The end result is you, you want to be good and to do right, but you cannot do it, and, and you don't do it in a consistent way. You have these two contrary forces at work in your life. He says they are at conflict with each other, and the end result is you don't do what you want. You don't get what you want. This is where we begin. Our lives are this battlefield of contrary desires. And by the way, the result of this battle is not good. You are not the winner. You are not the conqueror. You feel like no progress is being made. I mean, let's really be honest. If you rewind the tape and you get honest, you feel like so often 
No progress is being made. As one writer explained it like this, he says, honestly, I can't trust myself to have my best, my own best interest at heart. My choices may be ruled by my desires rather than by God's desires. I will not even acknowledge that I am not doing right. All my parts convince me that I am okay. I will hear the truth defined by me and not by God. And this is what it sounds like. Go with your instincts. You deserve it. Every, everyone else is doing it. You're only human. Come on, you were born this way. And then he says, life without God is dangerous because it feels so natural. It feels natural to us, right? It's like it's become a part of our nature. That's why he says the sinful nature. So you say, well, how do I know that I'm stuck going in this way? How do I know that this is driving my life? Paul says, here's where it goes. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says, look, if your life is only going to be driven by what you want, your desires alone, it's pretty obvious where that is going to lead. It's obvious. If there is no God and you can do whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. He says, why limit your sexual life? I'm not trying to be crass here, but why? Why not be with whoever you want and in whatever way you want? He says, of course, that's what you would do. And by the way, why not then, why not put anything into your body you want? Anything. It's your body, right? The next words, idolatry and witchcraft, remind us that if God isn't in our lives, we won't seek to be religious, but we'll find replacements for him in our lives. We start looking to other things for meaning and significance. We will fill the void with false gods of some kind or some form of spirituality looking for meaning and power. And then, and then he says there's hatred and discord and jealousy and fits of rage. And this is when I'm reading, I get really, really sad. Because it's when I begin to see that it's not just about it can hurt me, that it's going to put me at odds with all the people around me. Because you see, if I'm only pursuing what I want, you're not always going to do what I want. And if you don't do what I want, it's not going to be pretty. He says it leads to all kinds of brokenness in community. Now, I need to be really careful here. He's not saying this because he's saying, this is the law. I'm putting the law on you. He says, no, this is a whole way of life. He says, I'm telling you about this because God loves us. And these things lead to the kind of brokenness that will tear us down with shame and guilt that will be hard to carry through our lives and will destroy the relationships that are so important to us growing. This is coming from the love of God and it's so sad that if we're living for ourselves and our desires, we're gonna leave hurt people in our wake. Relationships will be constantly blowing up. Last week I shared a little bit of Ernest Hemingway's story. I mean, amazing writer, right, American writer. But the story of his life, his personal life, he was a guy who basically said, hey, if it's fun, I want to do it. And if it's real fun, I want to do it even more. And he didn't care that much about the people who were around him. His first wife, I don't know if you know this, but it, the backstory is really sad. His first wife he pushed into having two abortions because she became pregnant at a time he didn't want to have children. Yeah. And then, by the way, he reinvigorated his life by going from one wife or one woman to another. Later in life, Hemingway's son said that literally he and his mom, Pauline, were standing by the side of the road in Key West when his father just drove away. Three weeks later, after he divorced his mom, he'd married another woman. Three weeks later. And this was his life. And here's what's amazing to me. You know when Ernest Hemingway, he took his own life. That is what it's led to for him personally. And when he did, this is what his son said. I felt profound relief when they lowered my father's body into the ground, and I realized that he was already dead, that I couldn't disappoint him anymore. How sad is that? You see, his father had put so much stuff on him and blamed him for even his own struggles that this boy was carrying, he was relieved when he saw them lower his father's body into the ground. Paul says, I warn you as I did before, 
that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why does he say that? Is he threatening? No, he's saying the life we have here, the life we it should, it should naturally lead to the kingdom of God, right? It should, it should make sense for us to be a part of the kingdom of God. This is nothing like what God's kingdom is all about. It's all about life, and it's about peace, and it's about healing and caring and bringing relationships together. You see, our, our sinful nature works its way out in the worst sort of ways for us as human beings. It destroys human flourishing. And then just as you're here, just as you think as you get as low as you can, then there's this brilliant splash of beauty in these words. He explains the beauty of this new life that God has, has for us. Using the concept of fruit, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, you guys, it's, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. He says, look, this doesn't have anything to do with the law. The law can't produce this. As sad as the previous section, these words are amazing. He explains the fruit of the Spirit to tell us, by the way, this is produced by the Spirit of God at work in you, the presence of God in your life. We don't make these things happen ourselves. We can't cause them to flow from our lives. They spring from God himself and our relationship with him. And this is the life that we're called to live. First, there's an unconditional love that seeks to serve others without now any motive for personal gain. It's not selfish, it's self-giving. It flows from the fact that God has loved you first, and because of that, you're able to love others. Then there's the peace that Jesus brings first between us and God that makes it possible for us to bring reconciliation between us and other people. Then there's patience. You give people the time to grow, to heal, and to learn because you know it's taking time in your life. And so you're patient with them because you trust the slow work of God. Then there's kindness. It's just as it sounds. This person led by the Spirit is gracious with others because God has been gracious with them. There's goodness, which is one of the deepest character qualities. Goodness means that the person led by the Spirit treats other people with justice. And with righteousness. And then there's self-control. I'm sorry, uh, gentleness, faithfulness. Faithfulness is a spiritual dependability that means these character qualities can be counted on. And gentleness means that the person led by the Spirit has a graciousness of heart that treats other people with respect and care. Then there's self-control. I always stumbled over this one because this is about the Spirit's work. But what it means is this. As you learn to walk and live under the power of the Spirit, guess what begins to happen? You begin to see that the things that used to control you don't as they used to. Now the Spirit sets me free from the law of sin and death, and this freedom is seen in a new control over things that I didn't have before. Now again, these are not achievements. They come about as we walk with God, as we seek Him, as we enjoy Him each day. And it happens slowly in the context of of walking with God, sort of like this. I remember when my um, nephew, he's the oldest of my parents' grandchildren, he, um, uh, he went off to college and he went to the South. He was born here in Miami. And after a couple of years in Mississippi, we were like, his voice is starting to change. He's starting to talk like a Southerner. His name is Jed, and and one day I I spoke to him, and you know what he said to me? The most shocking thing. He said, yes, sir. I mean, I didn't know what to do with that, right? But guess what? He's in the South, and everybody sirs and mams everybody in Mississippi. And what I began to watch was he's now living in the South, and something has happened to him, this little transformation. He likes some food he didn't know about before. He talks in a way he didn't talk before. He relates to people in, in a little different way. And you know, that's the way the Spirit works, that as as you walk with God, as you read His Word, as you pray, as you worship, as you're seeking Him, you're learning this whole new life. It doesn't happen all at once, but it begins to happen, and there's a transformation. You see, led by the Spirit, we find that we're now producing this life-giving fruit, keeping in step with the Spirit, a whole new life begins to slowly develop and grow like that fruit, not all at once. 
So he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with all of its passions and desires. The thing that that, that used to hurt you and pull you away gets crucified because of the spirit and walking with God. And that's how the old life dies. In his book, Blue Like Jazz, Donald Miller tells a really interesting story about what happened when a rescue operation was conducted by some of our Navy SEALs. This is what he said. He said, the room was filthy and dark. The hostages were curled up in a corner, terrified. When the SEALs entered the room, they heard the gasps of the hostages. They stood at the door and called to the prisoners, telling them they were Americans. The SEALs asked the hostages to follow them, but the hostages wouldn't. They sat there on the floor and hid their eyes in fear. They were not of healthy mind and didn't believe their rescuers were really Americans. The SEALs stood there not knowing what to do. They couldn't possibly carry everybody out. What were they going to do? One of the SEALs got an idea. He put down his weapon, took off his helmet, and curled up tightly next to the other hostages. Getting so close, his body was touching some of theirs. He softened the look on his face and put his arms around them. He was trying to show them he was one of them. And by the way, none of the prison guards would have done anything like this. He stayed there for a while until some of the hostages started to look at him and finally meeting his eyes. The Navy SEAL whispered that they were Americans and they were here to rescue them. Will you follow us? He said to them. He stood to his feet and one of the hostages did the same and then another until all of them were willing to go. The story ends with all the hostages safe on an American aircraft carrier. And you know, I read that and I thought, it's not easy to be rescued. It's not easy from that place where we're stuck and we can't see a way forward and we don't know how things are gonna be different and it's been a long time, so long, that we have given up for us to believe that God has something different. So you know what he did? He came in and took off the helmet and he put his arms around us He put his arms around us so that he could get close to us, so that we could believe that there could be another life, that he could lead us to freedom. And you know what's really interesting? Paul, when he's dealing with this in his own life, and he says, I can't do it. I can't make it happen. This is what he said. He said, what a wretched man I am. He said, I've lived in this. I know what this feels like. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why Jesus came. He is the guy who took on human flesh. God didn't stay far away, but he came on a rescue mission. And when he did, he took on flesh just like you have so that he could get close to you and you could really learn and believe God loves you. And he did it so that he could lead you to freedom and to real safety. And this is why he went to the cross. That's why he's given us his spirit to lead us. He has done this for you you because he loves you and so Paul says look since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit since God has done this for you and his love is is free and it's unchangeable what if we live in this every day what if I learn to keep in step with this truth what if I come to know the spirit's presence in my life and I see my life change in ways that that I can never change it myself It is not simply about trying harder or getting more focused on the choices we make. It is not a direct approach at all. Life with God is different. But there is no part of you that cannot be transformed under the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we really need to believe this message. We need to believe that you're not far away just watching what's happening here. And watching us with what we struggle with, we need to believe that you came in flesh. That you know what we live with every day. And not only that, that this Jesus who came made it possible for us to be redeemed. And so we know, Lord, when we look at the resurrection, we see that even death is overcome by you. And we know that death, Lord, because though we're alive, there are days when we feel like we're living in it. 
And so, Lord, I pray that you would reassure us. You would pour out your spirit. And every day, we would keep in step by reading your word, by being willing to come to you in prayer, by seeking your face, calling out to you. And Father, thank you that you've made this provision for us. Thank you that you're the judge who left the bench and who joined us where we are because you know what we've been through. You know what we struggle with. And I pray in that, Lord, you'll give us hope. You'll give us the awareness that these things, you've given us all these things through the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we would trust that we have your Spirit. and We would learn to see and know the presence of your Spirit. And Father, I pray that you would bring about in your Spirit those things, that life that our heart really longs for. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.